All right, we're going to go ahead and get uh, started. Uh, hello, everyone, and welcome to another uh, session of the uh, Virtual Global Spine Conference. Uh, we're excited to have everyone here today with us. And uh, we're also excited to have a very uh, special uh, speaker today with us, a, um, a really a colleague and a friend. Uh, we overlapped at, uh, at uh, several places before, before, before this, and uh, we're excited to have him with us today. So uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Scott Zuckerman, who is at Vanderbilt University Medical Center. He is an assistant professor of neurosurgery and orthopedics, as well uh, as a co-director of the um, uh, of the Spine Center there. So we're absolutely happy to have uh, him with us today. His topic is going to be alignment goals for the fused spine, uh, including sagittal and coronal plane considerations. So Scott, great to uh, see you again and uh, welcome to uh, the Virtual Global Spine Conference. Yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, real honor to be here. Thanks to you. Thanks to Coy for the invitation. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about some of the alignment goals uh, for the fused spine, things to consider for the sagittal and, uh, and coronal plane. So disclosures, um, none relevant here, but I uh, just do some work with the NFL and for my time in Africa, I've had some Medtronic support uh, for living expenses there. So as an agenda, I'll spend the first half talking about sagittal plane alignment and the Russo Lee classification and then coronal plane alignment uh, with hopefully some cases mixed in so we can get some discussion going and really try to make the case of how these alignment principles apply to big deformity spine surgery, but really all spine surgery uh, that we do. I think about a year ago, uh, Mike Kelly gave an unbelievable talk on this topic, uh, sagittal alignment. And I, view, I view that as sort of the 500 level course. I think no one in the world understands this stuff as well as Mike does. Uh, so my goal and, and Camilla Molina also gave a similar talk uh, about a year ago. But, so my goal is to, is to keep talking about these important to topics of sagittal and coronal alignment, the Russo Lee classification, and really describe the basics, the fundamentals, and the key principles behind these theories and how I've implemented them in my daily practice. And in the words of a uh, friend and mentor, Alan Seals, every talk has a specific audience. So my, my audience here for this talk is really all trainees, residents, and fellows to touch on these key principles and then attendings to chime in on, on, on how they would handle cases and uh, critique and discussion. And then mid-level providers, of course, this can be relevant for as they're a vital part of most of our practices. So first in sagittal plane, we'll touch on early alignment and then go on to the Rousselli and degenerative principles of the Rousselli classification. So I won't belabor this point too much, but uh, our early thoughts on alignment were informed by the SRS Schwab classification, which uh, really started, got us thinking about these important concepts. Uh, and basically this described that we, we wanna meet PIL within 10 degrees, plus or minus 10 degrees. So a fairly wide range. And SVA less than five, pebble tilt less than 20. And with this was this was the standard uh, about 12 years ago. Uh, and as we've learned more about the sagittal plane, I think we, we sort of realized this is somewhat of an oversimplification. Still really useful, incredibly useful, probably fits most PIs, but the ranges of PIs, it may not be as useful. And it's not too surprising uh, because this these numbers came from predicting patients who had an ODI greater than 40, so severely disabled patients, differentiating them between moderately disabled. Uh, so it's not really predicting the ideal shape. It's just predicting those who are worse off and in, in the most pain. And five years later came the GAP score, uh, which was also really useful. A lot of people thought this would sort of be the, uh, the magic bullet and the answer to all our questions. And it has a lot of really important principles. Uh, but then we started to realize that this, like this paper from Griffin Baum, that the GAP score is useful, but may overestimate mechanical complications or may not be as useful uh, as we think. But I think the key takeaway from the GAP score that got us talking about was LDI, low dose distribution index, that our lower doses should be L4 to S1, about 35 to 40 degrees, and about two thirds of our lower doses in most people should be from four to one. And then that's, this has evolved for me into the Russo Lee classification. This is something that wasn't a huge part of my training, but I really tried to educate myself on in the last several years through reading courses, et cetera. And this is sort of where I'm at right now. I would highly recommend this textbook goes over a lot of important principles. I read it and reread it multiple times. And I'm always talking about cases with my co-fellows, Mina Carolus, Ian Buchanan, Alex Sa, and friend Adam Wegner, where we're always sharing ideas, talking about concepts, and trying to make each other better. So the Russo Lee classification really describes, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We don't want to have one measurement or one parameter that applies to everyone. It embraces the idea that we have a different, a lot of different normal spines, uh, type 1, type 2, type 3, and type 4. There is a fifth type, a type 3 antiverter that was added later that I won't touch on for this course, uh, 
uh, but it's based mainly on your sacral slope, which is somewhat different than we're used to thinking about it because we always start with PI. PI is important as the spine degenerates, which I'll touch on, but it's all based on sacral slope. And before we get into the different types, you have to understand the dim net and birth and model. So this was published in about, about almost 20 years ago, 18 years ago. And basically, it's a different way of thinking about the spine. It's the functional representation rather than the anatomic representation. And the spine is sort of made of two curves. You have the lordotic segment down here and the kyphotic segment above. And the center of each arc is defined as an apex. So there's the lordotic apex and there's the kyphotic apex. And the inflection point is when the spine transitions from lordosis to kyphosis. So thinking of these spine, the spine in two different circles is, is really the functional representation. And I would argue that the anatomical repartition that we were taught is really arbitrary. It's just based on where the ribs uh, end. But in reality, um, everyone's spine is a little different. This, the anatomical model really ignores the lordosis kyphosis reciprocity and probably is, again, somewhat of an oversimplif oversimplification and doesn't take into account everyone's individual spine. So getting deeper into Rousselli, I try to not use the term lumbar lordosis because a lot of people's lordosis ends at around L3. Some people's lordosis extends to T12 or T11 and try to use the term spinal lordosis and spinal kyphosis because that's more accurately descripts the lower lordotic arch uh, and the upper uh, kyphotic arch. And this is a picture of our, our combined orthoneurospine outcomes lab at Vanderbilt. And we really tried to study this and we tried to do research on it. So the two, two points that we really have tried to embrace to collect systematically is the apex. So where's the apex of your lordotic arch and the inflection point. And you can sort of look at the spine and tell, but to have our students and residents collect data on this, we really had to define these operationally and in a repeatable way to obtain these measurements. So how to measure the lumbar apex? I think for the most part, you can look at the spine and you can um, understand that this is basically where the lumbar apex is. Here you can easily see it's at L3, but the way to systematically do this is to um, measure each lower end plate. So start at S1, then measure the lower end plate of L5, lower end plate of L4, and extend up. And when the numbers start to transition, start to transition from positive to negative, that's the apex. Uh, so this is how to systematically do it as our team of our students and residents uh, have done for our database here. The inflection point's a little trickier. Uh, you do the same thing. You measure, use the lower end plane and measure that against the horizontal. Uh, but the, part, the higher you march up, eventually your numbers are gonna get less negative. They're gonna start to increase again, as you see here, negative 24, 27. Then it starts to go up again to less negative numbers, negative 21, negative, negative 20. The, um, the set after the vertebrae have decreased for two consecutive vertebrae, the first of those is the inflection point. And this is important because it's just harder to see the inflection point uh, looking at scoliosis films or whole spine. So this is how to operationally measure and define it as you start to learn these concepts. And there's the idea of two important equal arcs. So the first is that your sacral slope, which is right here, your sacral slope, just a line from the horizontal and the S1 end plate, is equal to your lower arc of lordosis right here. So that's how you, the reciprocity between these uh, two circles. So this is why the Rousselli classification is really based on the sacral slope. Rule two, which is uh, probably more relevant to our everyday practice, is that the upper arc of lordosis, so this is your upper arc of the lordotic uh, circle there, is equal to the lower arch of your kyphotic, kyphotic shape right there. And this is really important when we're talking about PJK. So this was sort of like a light bulb moment of PJK epiphany for me. So again, this if the upper arc of lordosis has to equal your lower arc of kyphosis, and your inflection point stays the same. If you get all your lordosis up top at L2, 3, 1, 2 with X lift, ACR, et cetera, you're going to massively increase this number, which has to increase and which has to equal the lower arc of, uh, of kyphosis. So there's only one way to balance the spine. If we increase our upper arc of lordosis, we have to increase our lower arc of kyphosis, and we have to acutely increase our kyphosis over a short segment. And that's going to lead to PJK or PJF, whether it has screws in it, instrumented. Or if it's not instrumented, you're gonna it's gonna fall right over into a PJF event, and hopefully not a neurologic uh, um, deficit. And you start to look at X-rays differently, right? This is a case shared by my friend Adam Wagner. You can start to tell the story of what happened to this patient. It looks like they had inner bodies five one four five, maybe those that implants were taken out, then had an L three four fusion, then may develop adjacent segment disease there. Someone did a big X lift at one two, which was just too much lordosis in the wrong spot, and they marched up there and eventually led to PJK. So getting more into the Rousselli, again, we start with sacral slope. So type one and type two are sort of in their own category, and then type three and type four. Type one and type two have a sacral slope less than 35. 
and type three and type four, type three is 35 to 45 and type four is greater than 45. And when we look at type one, again, a low sacral slope, this is a very low and short low dose. So the apex is five, the five body. Basically you go from your sacrum to your L5 body, most of your low, all your lower arc is right there because the apex is at L5. And your low dosis stops at around L3. Your inflection point is usually L2, 3. And then you have a long sweeping kyphosis. And your thoracolumbar lumbar junction is really kyphotic. So uh, we're taught that T10 to L2 should be neutral. But in reality, if it's a type 1, it's not. So if uh, I think about this with trauma. So if a birth fracture comes in and I'm trying to correct kyphosis, uh, if it's a type 1 patient, that should be somewhat kyphotic. If it's a type 3 or type 4 patient, then maybe it should be neutral or even somewhat prodotic. So that's a type 1 patient. Short acute lordosis with a long sweeping kyphosis. Type 2 has a low sacral slope as well, but this is more of a harmonious flat back. So lordosis is, not, is over a couple more levels. The apex is right around the L4 body compared to L5 or type 1 is L4 for type 2. And it's a long and flat spinal lordosis. And the inflection point is higher and more anterior, probably closer to the thoracolumbar junction. But this is a time where a flat back is appropriate and normal. Type three is sort of the spine, how I think of it as how Netter drew it in our textbooks. It's a well-balanced, harmonious spine. Sacral slope is between 35 and 45. The lower arc of lordosis is more prominent. The apex moves up to L4 or about the L3-4 disc. And it's a, overall a well-balanced, harmonious spine. And the TL junction is, is neutral. The inflection point is right around there. And then when we go from type three to type four, is basically a... Um, Exaggeration of type three is type four. It's got a higher sacral slope, a higher PI. You can have five plus vertebrae and lordosis. And the inflection point can be a T12, T11, or even higher. So it's basically type three, but more curves and more exaggerated. So one thing that Mike Kelly says in his talk, which I really agree with, is that spine surgery is a spectrum. And it's not an either or. Degenerative deformity are really different sides of the same coin. So how does these, how do these classifications, the Rusli classification apply to degenerative spine disease? Well, it helps us understand the high stress zone. So type one and two is gonna be a much straighter spine with not a lot of curve to it. And you're gonna to evolve to degenerative disc disease. You're gonna have disc herniations and disc disease, and that's how you're gonna degenerate. Whereas type three or four, you have a higher sacral slope. You're gonna be more likely to have a spondylolisthesis and facet disease and have those staircase spine, that multi-level slip. And so, Taking the case of degenerative spondylosis is something all spine surgeons see and all spine surgeons treat. 85% of patients with a DGN spondy are type three or four. And you can ask yourself, why is that? Well, I think it is for, for, for probably three reasons. Number one, high sacral slope. So you're just gonna have high shear forces. L5 is gonna, just gonna wanna slide forward on S1 based on gravity. So high sacral slope. Also, there's more pressure on the facets. When you have so much room for low dose your spine, you're putting a lot more pressure on your facets and they're more likely to degenerate. And also, for the, when you're doing, when you're adding more lordosis, there's less room. So less room for the facets to work, and they're used, more likely to generate. And in these patients, L1 to S1 is often appropriate, but lower down, L4, L4 to S1 is often hypolordotic, especially in the case of mul multiple spondies in a row. And you can, it's important how to evaluate this slip. Is it inflection? Is it an extension? So this is sort of a great picture from the Russell Lee textbook, evaluating one level spondy. This is neutral extension, which is good because you're maintaining alignment, but at the same time, uh, you are crunching down your neural foramen, you're more likely to have radiculopathy or a neurogenic claudication. And same with kypho uh, if you're kyphotic, it's good because you're decompressing the neural elements, but, um, but you're more likely to be out of line. And so on all patients, what I try and do is get long cassette films on any, on any lumbar fusion. I'm not saying that I'm, I'm turning every smaller or degenerative case into a deformity case, but I just like to know. I like to know what the rest of the spine looks like, and I like to know um, what the PI is, sacral slope, and have a good view of that. And I put this picture in here because I don't want to lose the forest in the tree. This is one of my partners uh, who helped train me, Rich Berkman, uh, an outstanding spine surgeon. And um, you don't want to lose the forest from the trees. Don't forget to do a good decompression. This is a great picture that I, I think all junior residents should really look at and, and embrace. Where you get your stenosis. The superior articular facet can become overgrown, called in lateral recess stenosis. And in the case of a split, your IAP can slip forward and cause your stenosis. So if we nail the alignment, but you under decompress the patient, you've certainly done them a disservice. So don't forget about performing ad adequate decompression and what we have to do to decompress the, the neural elements. So first case I'll present, 56-year-old uh, male just with a one-level DGN spondy. This is actually a patient of my partner's who signed up for surgery, uh, but he's 56-year-old male. He had back and leg pain, and he all of a sudden experienced new urinary changes and he was sent to the ER at around 4 p.m. for these changes. Not full-blown cauda but he had had some urinary retention. I think his PVR was around um, 
300. So I can open up to the audience if anyone wants to chime in on how they'd handle this. Yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, and ask uh, ask around. Uh, uh, while while some of those uh, uh, while some of those answers come in, I, I think I see a few of our co-hosts with us. Alfredo or Mike, uh, also Dr. Gibbs is with us, our neuroradiologist. If anybody wants to chime in, please feel free to do so. Or you can. Hey, Ali. It's Mike. Hey, Ali, it's Mike. I'm in the car, but I'll, I'll chime in. <laughs> so it looks like this is a degen, a degen spondy, yeah, with uh, acute neurological deterioration. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think the you know the European based RCTs tell us that this patient should be decompressed alone, and I use a spinous process sparing decompression, get really wide, do it like a mini open, not muck around with end endoscopic, and uh, then I would see how they go, and if if they needed anything done in the future, I'm going to do an anterior column fusion with posterior support, because uh, I think you know acute fusions in this situation um, can be done, and I've certainly done it before. Uh, I've actually done a full decompression in a similar situation via an ALIF for someone that had had uh, a prior posterior surgery. But I think, you know, for the residents and for what the, the data is telling us on these cases um, is that a posterior decompression is probably the evidence-based option for this person at the moment. That's my opinion. Yeah, great. Totally. I mean, I, yes, completely agree. The randomized controlled trials, DGEN Spondy, get them out of neurologic trouble, especially in an emergency setting. Now, this patient was signed up for a, a T-lift, so I felt sort of uh, obliged to carry out the plan of, uh, of my, my partner. But you're right. I think you could, most importantly, go straight to the OR, anyone with urinary changes. But whether you decompress or fuse, I think is, uh, is certainly up. I just did a one-level fusion here. Nothing fancy, open, emergency, not, not messing around with anything uh, uh, smaller. So just a one level fusion. But the point here is that I'm just trying to keep these alignment principles in mind. I want to reduce the spondy. I want to get as much lower doses as level as possible. Uh, and you can see pre-op, he was around 14 degrees, post-op 24 degrees. Part of his issue is, is he's somewhat flat at 5.1, but we're not going to address that in the, in the emergency setting. So whether you decompress or decompress and fuse, I think just keep keeping these alignment uh, uh, principles in, in mind. So how does, how does the Rusalite types apply to, 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 to the degenerative spine? So um, keeping those degenerative principles in mind, I, I gave a similar talk at Vanderbilt and I put this slide up and I can see the whole audience's eyes glazed over because it's somewhat daunting. But I, I, in the next couple of slides, I'll explain that there's, there's really a couple of simple principles that can help explain how we apply the Rusalite classification and how the normal spines can become pathologic. And keep in mind our, our ways we compensate for pathosis. Uh, I think the first thing that people will say is pelvic retroversion, and that's true, but don't forget about local hyperextension. The first thing we do is extend back above or below to try and make up for the lower doses. Uh, then pelvic tilt and then thoracic hypokyphosis, increasing pelvic tilt and then thoracic hypokyphosis or flattening air in your thoracic spine, even thoracic lower doses. So with these compensatory mechanisms in mind, sort of this is sort of my three-step process for determining the pathologic brucelli type. The first is look at your PI. In a normal spine, we use sacral slope to tell us uh, what type it is, but when the spines are generated, uh, PI is really our only remnant of what original type they be. So if the PI is less than 50, we say uh, rule of thumb, you're usually a type one or two. If the PI is greater than 50, probably gonna be a type three or four. These aren't hard and fast, black and white, but general, those are the, um, that's where you wanna put patients. Second point is to look at pelvic position. So are they retroverting the pelvis? If the pelvic tilt roughly is greater than 50% of the pi and the PI, then yes, they're retroverting the pelvis to some extent. And that leads to these false types. And what I mean by that is when the pelvic tilt goes up, the sacral slope goes down. And that means that you're gonna look like you're a, a type three, or if you're a type four, you may look like you're a type three or type two. So a type two may devolve to a type one, a type three may go to a false type two, which can be quite dangerous and type four, et cetera. So assessing the amount of pelvic retroversion through pelvic tilt is the second step. And then the third step is looking at your thoracic spine. Is your thoracic spine, Appropriately kyphotic, are you compensating through hypokyphosis or even a lordotic thoracic spine? And then are you degenerating into a thoracic kyphosis or a global kyphosis picture? So if we go back to our chart, one thing that's important to mention is that all roads lead to the same place. Whether you're a type one, type two, type three, or type four, global kyphosis is the, uh, 
is where everyone ends up. Um, when all mechanisms have failed and you lose the ability to lower dose your, your lower R. The second point I want to make again is that with compensatory hyperextension or pelvic retroburden, each type can become a lower type that creates your false type. So for example, type two, if type two starts to become um, kyphotic above, basically you arch back as much as possible uh, to lower dose lower down, which makes you look like a type one. So a type two can look like a type one as they degenerate. And instead of having lower doses through your thoracal lumbar spine, you end up becoming kyphotic and that can degenerate to uh, lumbar kyphosis with a flat thoracic spine and global kyphosis. Same for type three, if you retrovert your pelvis, Again, your PT goes up, sacral slope goes down. You can, may look, you can look like a false type two where your hips are way out in front of your sacrum. Uh, you look balanced, but you're really not. And same with type four. Can, with retroversion, type four can go to a type three. That can eventually go to a type two, losing your ability to control your thoracic spine and the inguinal kyphosis. So just knowing that each type can sort of go down based on the pelvic tilt, uh, I think is, is a good way to contextualize uh, this classification system. And this is um, just showing which, are, which types are most common. Type three and type four most likely to generate, but the false type twos, the retroverter false type twos that look balanced, but they're really, uh, their hips are way out in front of their spine. So case two, with some of these Russell Lee principles in mind, a 61 year old male, severe back pain. He's had five prior lumbar spine surgeries. Uh, he's in a wheelchair due to pain. He's got screw pull out at L4 and a severe kyphotic deformity. And these are his Phillips, you can see on the PA, he's leaning to the left a little bit, but on the uh, lateral, it's severely kyphotic. He's really in a, in a global kyphotic picture. His thoracic spine is actually somewhat lordotic, but he's leaning significantly forward. Uh, very high SVA. His PI is low, 36, um, and quite mismatched. These are supine films, so you can see he is mobile here, especially at the 3-4 uh, level. He's got fractured screws at 4-5, so he's got a pseudo there. And this is his story. He started out with a two-low fusion and just didn't heal for whatever reason. Uh, yeah, I think he was a smoker at the time and then stopped smoking several years later. Someone tried to go anterior with a lateral approach that uh, didn't fuse. And then the screws eventually became loose and he pulled out leading to almost catastrophic kyphosis. It's also somewhat uh, stenotic at the L3-4 level uh, above. So open this up to the audience. What would, uh, how would anyone, what would anyone do here? Yeah, definitely, definitely a tough case. Uh, Alfredo, you seem like you're excited to tackle this case. <laughs> and <an> easy case. <laughs> uh, it looks like uh, he's lagging a lot of lordosis in the lower lumbar spine. And even even uh, if I attempted to go uh, to the superior levels to get corrector, it's easier. It's, it's mobile. Uh, probably is uh, neumo disc in there. It's back of phenomenal. I think the problem is in the lower spine. I need to address in the lower spine because uh, when you have a low... PI, the 80% uh, of the lordosis need to be in uh, between L4 to S1. Uh, so um, no matter what, I try to, even if it, it will be very difficult to have a posterior approach, multi-level posterior approach, an A-leaf, you know, L4-5, I think we need to address uh, lordosis in the lower spine. Yeah, totally agree. Totally agree. When I first saw this, I said, great, we're going to land flat. And then all his correction three, four, he'll be upright. He's in a wheelchair for almost a year and a half. We don't have to make him perfect. But then the more I thought about it, you see the low PI. And this is really a type one or two patient. So he needs low lordosis. So despite the challenges, the scar dissection, um, we looked at uh, for this patient. Again, he's a PI of 36. He's a type one or two, type one or type two. And he really needs low lordosis. And he's devolved into sort of a global kyphosis. So my plan here was just that L5 to L5 PSO. I would do a T lift at 3-4, both, both for decompression and infusion and some correction at 3-4. Um, and then my original plan was a UIV at T12 and T12 to sacrum fusion, T12 to pelvis instrumentation. And so this is sort of the plan I make for every case, screw sizes, and I try and write out the steps both for me and the whole OR, my trainees, the reps, and not to go through point by point, but this is sort of how I prepare for a case and how I play the movie. Um, so... And this is what we got for his end result, but you'll see um, he's standing up nice and straight, which is great. Uh, but my original UIV was T12. And I think that was probably could have been a little wiser about that. Uh, I think the re he ended up getting PJF in about a month. So I took him back and revised him. Luckily, no neurodeficit and really wasn't that much of a, a setback. And he's now about a year out, uh, very happy and walking and doing great. But I think uh, the PJF event was probably just T12. It's not the best level, in my opinion. I haven't had the best luck there. And if your screws aren't perfect, uh, I think you may predispose to PJF, but 
I was happy with low dose, uh, low doses below, and uh, you can see his his uh, head is behind his hips. So, is that where you're thinking, Alfredo? Uh, it's a beautiful result. Uh, in my mind, this this low PI patients, um, I try to get plus ten degrees uh, of the pelvic incidence. When it is an intermediate P, uh, pelvic incidence like uh, forty, I try to go to forty. And with a high pelvic incidence like 70, I, I plan to go minus 10 degrees of the pelvic incidence. It's a fast uh, count, uh, but you need to, to get uh, very reasonable with the inflection point as, as you did in this case. I, I have a question about the, the previous case or in general. Um, how much do you take pain into consideration for the dealignment? Uh, because most of the, the threshold or the targets of the uh, angles of the numbers we use uh, are based on mostly asymptomatic patients. So, but for example, in the first case you, you, you showed, uh, maybe the kyphotic position was all uh, a compensation of the pain. So mm -hmm. when I see a lot of these uh, pre past uh, images in social media, I see, oh, that's a, uh, plus 10 kyphosis angle in other four five, and I get 25 angles with a TLA. That's impossible. Uh, and that is, mostly of the, those cases are patient uh, self compensate when you, yeah. you decompress enough, you know? Um, and in this uh, severe deformities, like this case you, you're showing, um, up to when you consider pain as a decompensation parameter. Yeah, your first point, you're right. I mean, I was just comparing the standing to the uh, pre-op to post-op, but you're right. When you lay them on the table, they get a lot better. And you can, I, I, I think in that case, I did a PCO just because I wanted to really reduce the spondy. But you're right. When you get them on the table, um, you can you can usually get better than how they stand. As far as pain into account, I mean, this guy was in a lot of pain. He really couldn't walk. So I, I guess his alignment is completely off. But I, of course, I, I think I get your question, but I, I consider his pain and I, and I one of the goals of surgery is to get him standing up straighter and that's decreasing his pain, especially because he had a pseudo and implant failure. I think that answers your question, but- um, Yeah, absolutely, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, uh, so a couple, so if you're looking at what, post-op, it's always really interesting to look at these patients. Where do we get them? I would say at first, it looks more like a type one because he's got an acute lordosis and the apex is kind of L5, but then I looked at him more, if this was type one, Historical lumbar junction should be kyphotic, and it's really not. So I'd say this is probably more of a type two of harmonious flat back is what we turn him to. Of course, didn't mention he's got uh, fractured screwed in cervical spine, but no neck pain. So we left that alone. And this is just an intro picture, something that I've done. I try to lay some uh, cortical uh, allograft across any big laminectomy defect. And uh, I think that's helpful. I've got, I've had to go back on two cases, and I'm not going to say that it completely fuses, uh, but I think it does add stability. One was in there pretty solid. Both were in there pretty solid, but on the CT, it didn't look fused, but that's something I try to do to cover a long uh, laminectomy defect. So case three, 59-year-old female, uh, prior non-instrumented. Hey, yeah. Hey, it's Coy. Hey, Coy. How are you, man? Hey, good. Thanks for joining us. Sorry to be late. Um, I have a question for you on this last case. So, you know, it seems like that last case was a pretty uh, flexible deformity. So when the patient laid down, they're actually pretty well aligned. And uh, at least on the MRI, uh, uh, you know, uh, all the disc spaces sort of above L3, if I recall correctly, look pretty, uh, pretty reasonable. So what would, you say, what would you say to someone who might want to treat this with, let's say, uh, uh, anterior column realignment at L3-4 and then stop short? Like, let's say, get really focal um, uh, kyphosis, uh, sorry, lordosis at, uh, at the 3-4 disc. Um, yeah, and then, you know, if you get, uh, if you do a Smith-Peterson uh, at that same level, you, you get the full correction of the cage. So whether, you know, 20, 25, or 30, you know, whatever your goals are. Yeah. And then stopping short, uh, what do you think about the dur potential durability of that that uh, procedure? Yeah, I mean, I think technically a lot easier, a lot less risk to the patient for sure. But I think a higher PI, you might be able to get away with it. But this is a very low PI. I think it was 35 or 30, how much what was it? Uh, 36. So yeah, I think you really got to keep this low at L5 or L4, probably acceptable, but something higher up, I think probably just mis honestly misplacing your apex. Um, but uh, to say that may not work, I may not improve him. I'm sure we get some improvement, but I just worry about the durability a little bit, especially because it's such a, a low PI, uh, a low PI patient, a true type one or a true type two. 
great. Thank you. Yeah, all right. So it's next case here, uh, 59-year-old female, uh, prior non-instrumented 5-1 fusion, um, L2 to 4 lateral fusion about three years ago as an adult, who that's with uh, severe back pain and difficulty standing up. Uh, these are her uh, scoliosis films here. You can see down to 5-1, it's kind of hard to make out, but she had, again, had an insight to on lay fusion as a kid. So 5-1 is about a grade two spondy it was fused in, then has this lateral fusion here. Coronal plane is completely fine. Sagittal plane, and she's a very high PI patient. PI is 75, and her thoracic pain, thoracic spine is totally straight. So really compensating there. It's almost lordotic. And this is what her MRI looks like. You can see she's got a great fusion. She's got no stenosis at all, pristine canal all throughout from L2 down. Uh, but she's got some arthritis above, so she's clearly trying to compensate a retrolysis there. And so PI 75, so this is, we went over a type one or two patient, looking at a type three or four. Uh, what, open up to the audience, uh, how, what anyone would do here. I gotta take this one. Uh, this looked like a high grade spawning case with a long, long standing compensation. Uh, this is a completely different case like, like the previous one. I, 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 in these kind of cases, I try to change the PI of these patients doing a, an S1 osteotomy, pedicle subtraction osteotomy. Uh, that will align pretty good the lordosis with, uh, with the new PI. So uh, are you, you're changing the inflection point, you're changing everything. Uh, it's pretty kind of difficult to get uh, distal uh, attachments in the pelvis, but if you can get uh, two screws per side, in the iliac and um, a good decompression of uh, L5 and S1 roots, it's pretty feasible. And um, I think that will be much help for, for this case. Great, yeah, and the and S1 PSO, you know, the anatomy was all challenging anatomy down here because you lose all your landmarks on lay fusion. But yeah, I think that's a great, uh, great option. Anyone else? Not very common. Hey, Scott, it's Mike. Yeah, Mike, go ahead. Hey, uh, you know, I, I think S1 PSOs are cool, uh, but these are super challenging operations when they've got an old style postrolateral fusion with a big bone mass there. I mean, you can do them with NAV, um, certainly done them in revision situations with that. But, you know, these high PI patients may be a, an opportunity to use a hyper uh, lordotic um, lateral cage at, uh, you know, the upper lumbar levels, um, even into the thoracic level. And then, so almost to a, an upper ACR, like it's been done at the mid lumbar levels there, and uh, and try that first. And I, and I think you're going to need that even if you do a sacral osteotomy. So I don't think it's unreasonable to to try to get some alignment back through that ACR type approach at the top uh, in this particular case. It's probably what I'd look at. And what's your UIV for that, Mike? Yeah, that's a tough one. I, I tend to finish a nine for these on um, a soft landing. So I use a lot of sublaminar bands and tethers at the top, but I know that's not everyone's cup of tea, but I, I'd probably finish at nine. Uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think yeah, to, to, to Coy's point, technically easier, less uh, less uh, morbidity to the patient. Uh, but I think the only thing people talk with such a high PI, you think upper thoracic, uh, which is more a lot more surgery. Uh, but I think that's reason that's uh, definitely a reasonable approach. But if I did that, you really misplaced the apex, and I would want to try and cover the rest of the thoracic spine because I worry about PJK or PJF. But certainly, uh, certainly an option. Anyone else? Before I show you what I did. So, conceptualizing this patient, uh, this you know, long-standing compensation, like Alfredo said, thoracic hypokyphosis. This is a really type four patient and her sacral slope is 42. Pelvic tilt is 33. So she's 33 is not completely half of 75, but she's got some element of retroversion. And she's downgraded herself from type four to a false type three. And because her sacral slope is between 35 and 45, so that makes her type three. So false type three, and I'd put her here, retroverted type three. And again, I thought, uh, I sort of split the difference between what Alfredo and Mike said. I didn't want to go up high, but I didn't, uh, S1 PSO seems, um, you know, would have been challenging with all the online fusion. So, oh, the first stage, uh, well, I settled on an L4 PSO and a T10 to pelvis. And, but the first stage of this was removing the lateral screws she has at L4 because I wanted to, if I was going to do something challenging through the on, through fusion mass and do an L4 PSO, I wanted, I didn't want to encounter that lateral screw as I'm doing my PSO. So I did a 
small first stage just to remove with vascular assistance, remove the screws from the side so I could stack the deck in my favor and then L4 PSO. And I used a French company, SMIO, to help plan the surgery. They, they really embraced the Russell Lee classification and are incredibly helpful. And um, this is my planning case with all the different steps uh, of the case uh, that helped me, again, conceptualize what we wanted to do. And these are the uh, post-op films. So you can see extending, extending down with a bit long iliac screws, at least 8580 uh, PSO at L4. L5, I think, would have been another option, but L5 was such a steep angle. L4 was pretty steep too, but I thought it was doable. I thought about L3 or L2, but I just didn't want to misplace the apex too much. Um, and you can see standing up, uh, she's about a couple months out and, and is hanging in there. Again, Mike Kelly and others say with a high PI, I just go to the upper thoracic spine, and I didn't do that in this case, so I'm holding my breath a little bit, but hopefully she holds there. Any comments, critique? Great result, please. Yeah. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, there's a CT just showing that. I put a cage with some BMP to just help the bony opposition for most of my PSOs. And I think one, one learning point here, um, I think that I, I want that I want to share, this is an intraoperative picture, so cranial caudal here. I really try and go extremely wide, especially low PSO, very wide with the roots. So follow the roots out as far as possible, but a wood sin or a pen field, uh, pen field three right on top of the root and come through the soft tissue. So these roots are followed even down deep into the psoas. When I think I've gone far enough, go farther. That takes time and there's a lot of bleed, a lot of epidural, well, they're not epidural veins, but a lot of veins. Uh, and it takes time, but it's truly worth it because I really want the roots to be completely free as we close this. This was, and also for this PSO, because four was so steep, most PSOs, you're just working between the roots, but I even had to work in the axilla of L4 here to take away as much of the L4 body as we could. So before we go to coronal, he asked, why, why has Rusli not been universally accepted when it has such value? I think a lot of reasons. It's art more than a science. You can't just apply one thing to all patients. Each patient's really unique, and it's hard to do research for these nuanced topics. And I, any neurosurgeon on the call is probably wondering why I have a picture of a VP shunt. Well, I would compare the Rusli classification to a shunt. There's no, I tell residents, uh, there's no quick way to do a shunt consult, right? You can't just look at a CT and say that person's fine. You got to say, why do they have the shunt? What are their failures in there? What are the vents doing? It just takes time. Same thing with this. It takes time and a lot of learning for to embrace this classification, but I think it is um, it is worth it. We've tried to do this. These are my partners, Byron and Amir, some of our students. We've tried to embrace this and try and do research on this topic, and hopefully we'll be sharing some of these abstracts at uh, NAS this year. So transitioning from sagittal plane to coronal plane, uh, Talk about definitions, classifications, uh, post-op risk factors for post-op coronal malalignment, and then some intraoperative techniques. Any questions, comments on the sagittal stuff before we go to the coronal? Are you All using right. uh, L1 pelvic angle, uh, or are you still using the classics? Yeah, I, I I've started to use it more. I don't quite, you know, I know Mike Kelly, a lot of people love Jeff Hills was at Vanderbilt who really led that. L1PA is extremely well, I haven't figured out an exact way. I use it interop to estimate, but I really use the rest of my numbers because it's interoperatively, it's a little easier to draw to measure sagittal cob angles and coronal alignment. So its value is incredible, but I just personally haven't, and I use it to corroborate what I'm finding, but some of the traditional angles are a little more useful. For me. Great. So coronal plane, I put this because my daughter was in a big, uh, Elmo stage for a while. She's kind of dropped Elmo and is really Peppa Pig uh, at the moment. But coronal plane and deformity surgery is less talked about. Uh, some people say oh, it's simpler, just line the spine up. But I would argue it's it's equally complex. Uh, it's associated with more invasive surgery, high risk of rod fractures, and it can be really hard to evaluate intraoperatively. And I'm always trying to think of easy analogies for the residents, analogies to explain things. And I'm a big sports fan. So if I look to sports, how would I compare the two? Well, I think the sagittal plane um, is, is, is comparable to Shohei Atani. He's a phenom. He pitches, he hits, he does everything. He's on the cover of G crew. He's got a lot of attention. Sagittal plane gets all the attention, but anyone who knows the angels know that arguably the best player or, or the less talked about player, but equally good as Mike Trout. So I think Mike Trout represents the coronal plane here. Sorry for the, the baseball references for our overseas crowd, but, and, you know, I'm from New York and baseball history. So look at the sagittal plane. I'd say he's like Babe Ruth got a ton of attention. Sultan of SWAT. He's got a cigar. He's out in the town, but really the guy who showed up to work every day and didn't get talked about as much, but was just as good as a coronal plan. And then two sport athletes get mentioned a lot. Deion Sanders, one of the best prime time gold chain, 
But among two sport athletes, the one that's probably the, the unsung hero is Bo Jackson, just a freak of an athlete and a great book if anyone would like to read. So um, getting back into the, um, the material here. So definitions of our uh, coronal alignment. So first to go over some regional alignment. And the first, uh, probably the, one of the most important things to know is the lumbosacral fractional curve. I think for any big scoliosis, your eyes go toward the major curve, but the fractional curve sets the stage for everything. Uh, patients are often symptomatic with lumbar radiculopathies on the concavity. So on the left side here, the L5 or L, in this case, L5 nerve root probably gets crunched and they can have quite painful radiculopathies and weakness. Also, it's very stiff. Sometimes the L5 TP is touching the sacral ala or even fused and interoperably this anatomy can be challenged to navigate. And if you don't correct this, your base isn't strong. Your spine is taking off in a way that you want. So noting the lumbosacral fractional curve is, is the first step in, in what I look at. And then this is a great paper put out by James Lynn and Dr. Lenke that made an adult classification. So they combined the AIS classification, basically added a lumbosacral modifier because all adult kids, adolescents don't have one, but adults have a lumbosacral fractional curve. So this is a patient I operated on about three weeks ago. And using that as an example, uh, proximal divide the spine, just like the lanky classification, proximal thoracic, main thoracic, thoracolumbar slash lumbar, and then really taking note of the lumbosacral fractional curve. And uh, post-op, and I wasn't sure how this case was going to go. If She's fused from 41. So if the major curve was stiff, then maybe I would need a kickstand rod to push her to the left. But if it all loosened up, then I may push her too far, uh, push her too far to the left and may, may need to push her back to the right. So this is what we did interoperatively. And you can see she's leaning a little bit uh, to the left because everything's straightened out and she, and uh, except for the fused lumbosacral fractional curve, but hopefully with time she'll stand better. And this is her first x-ray. This is another question I was worried. How they stand on day five, is that predictive of two years? So this is a question we asked and basically asked this in the coronal plane. Do post-op x-rays change from immediate post-op uh, to two years? And the answer was, answer was interesting. About 45% of patients experience change of greater than one centimeter. And of this 45%, this is some of the good news in deformity surgery, challenging surgery. 75% improve and 25% worsen. So that immediate post-op x-ray, they don't quite know how to stand. They're in pain. And this is evidence to show that they can improve spontaneously over time. This is a patient I operated on uh, about a year and a half ago, small lumbar scoliosis. Uh, immediately post-op, we straightened out her curve, but she was leaning more to the left. And I was like, what? what's happened? But with time, six months, she straightened out more. And, and, and this is true for patients fused to the sacrum where you think they really can't change how, how, how they stand, but even this patient who's not instrumented to the sacrum. So globally, I'll go over some definitions here. So really try to use the term coronal vertical axis. I think most people use the CSVL, central sacral vertical line, but if you really think about it, that's just a line. Uh, we're really looking for a distance. So the CVA is a nice corollary to the SVA too. So that's why we use this term just to standardize our language. And the goal is to be less than uh, less than three centimeters uh, difference between the CSVL and C7PL. Some authors define coronal malalignment as four centimeters, some do two centimeters, but really I think three centimeters is probably the most accepted threshold. And then we've also tried to extend this to the head. In, this, in the sagittal plane, instead of using C7, a lot of people are, use the EAC. Well, we wanted to do the same thing in the coronal plane. And the medial orbits are very hard cortical bone. Um, that you can always see on x-rays. I think the ethmoid bone, maxillary, lacrimal, and sphenoid bone come together, and you can usually always see this. Uh, so we found that a did sound value was better at predicting complications than the C7 CVA. And if you had a difference between your orbital and your C7, that was also a risk factor for complications. And there's just several different x-rays from the paper showing that you can usually identify the medial orbits pretty well. The odontoid is something also to consider. But we found the odontoid is hard to see uh, because of dentition and also severe kyphosis. If your head's forward, uh, like this patient on the right, you really have a hard time seeing the odontoid. So pelvic obliquely and leg length discrepancy, these were somewhat confusing black box terms for me, but I'm dialing them in, uh, trying to simplify them. PO is defined any misalignment of the pelvis caused by either leg length discrepancy, something extrinsic, or scoliosis, which would be intrinsic. And again, it's all over the place with the literature. Some people use angles, some people use distances, uh, some people use the uh, iliac crest, some people use the acetabuli or femoral heads. I would say the acetabuli is probably more reliable and better to measure intraoperatively. So that's what I, I try and do. Uh, but the literature is all over the place and it can be confusing. Leg length discrepancy, uh, just basically as it sounds, inequality in the length of both lower extremities. Uh, I think most of the orthopedic world uses a threshold of two centimeters, but I've also seen one centimeter. And it can cause by hip problems, pelvic dysplasia, asymmetric hip or knee flexion, or true leg discrepancy. For this, you need EOS x-rays to measure. 
and it's probably the best classification for the coronal plain is, is the chew classification or the bath classification. I've heard it uh, referred to as both. And this is elegant, it's simple, and it's intuitive, everything you want in a classification system. And the way they divide it, type A is any CVA that is less than three centimeters, type A. Type B is a CVA greater than three centimeters, and your head is towards the concavity. Uh, and whereas type C is the opposite, CVA greater than three centimeters, and your head is towards the convexity. The type C ones are the ones that can really at risk of throwing off. This, as I said, is a great classification system, but there's, I think, a couple areas for improvement. Uh, there's no way to define the major curve. As we were doing research collecting data on this, we found that sometimes your thoracal lumbar curve is just as big as your fractional curve. So which one is relevant? Which one is the major curve? Is something to consider. And then type A's are really the snake in the grass. You think type A less than three, they're good. They're normal. I just got to worry about the malaligned ones. But exactly like this patient, this patient, though they're well balanced, maybe their CBA is uh, under a centimeter. If you correct the major curve, you're going to throw them off to the right, really at risk for creating iatrogenic coronal malalignment. So type B's are probably some, in some ways the easiest because you correct the curve, the head goes over the hip and the pelvis and you're good. I'll also mention this, the OB classification, which is a, uh, a little more extensive and actually provides surgical strategies for how to correct, uh, but it's just different ways of saying the same thing. So an OB type one would be a chew B, OB type two would be a chew C, where the head is towards the convexity. But I encourage you to read this paper as it's uh, uh, very useful. So why else is a coronal plane malalignment? If I want to compare a coronal plane to these titans of sport, why else does it matter? Well, I think there's Fewer compensatory mechanisms available. We saw in the sagittal plane, you can retrovert your pelvis, you can lower dose, you can bend your knees, extend your neck. In the coronal plane, there's just not as much available to us. Uh, there's asymmetric hip and knee flexion, but that's a lot more likely to uh, fall. It's much harder to walk. And big thing, when you sit down, your sagittal malalignment is gone, but coronal malalignment is present sitting and standing and can be very fatiguing to patients. And this is uh, data that's currently in submission, but just showing this is the ODI, uh, on top, and these are different four sort of alignment groups, neutral alignment, coronal malalignment only, sagittal malalignment only, and combined. This is all preoperative, so nothing after surgery. Uh, so preoperatively, we see that sagittal malalignment adds a lot to your ODI increases, but when you add coronal malalignment on top of that, you get a statistically significant worsening. So again, coronal malalignment with sagittal malalignment is makes things significantly worse. And these are also more extensive surgeries. This is a paper we worked on comparing coronal sagittal plane and invasiveness. We found coronal malalignment had more instrumented levels, PCOs and T-lifts, and CVA had a stronger physical association with invasiveness. So here we have the continuous variable, variables of CVA and SVA, and here's blood loss and operative time. What we see is the CVA has a stronger association with blood loss, a steeper slope, a higher beta value, blood loss and operative time in the sagittal plane. So these are hard to correct, and we spend more time in surgery trying to correct them. Also, this is a paper looking at rod fractures, so risk factors for rod fractures, and we found something we, we, we weren't expecting. Basically, that coronal correction greater than three centimeters was independently associated with rod fractures, and we found no such relationship with the sagittal plane. And then looking at risk factors for coronal malalignment, so we found among 243 patients, single center, uh, post-op coronal malalignment rate was 18%, so not incredibly high, but not uh, not zero either. And predictors were, as expected, the more malaligned you were before CVA, SVA, public obliquity, the more likely you were to have coronal malalignment. And this is just showing that type A patients, you have about a 9% rate of iatrogenic coronal malalignment, so taking patients who are aligned, creating CM. Type B, 28%, but it's really the type C percent. 41% of type C patients had a post-op coronal malalignment. And this is just looking at iatrogenic coronal malalignment. And even though these would be classified as 2A, uh, any even if less than, less than three centimeters, uh, the head towards the concavity of the fractional curve or the head towards the convexity of the major curve is a risk factor for creating coronal malalignment. These are more papers, uh, Alex Deolvius, who actually has a great talk on coronal malalignment out there uh, as well, all showing that type C patients are the ones you have to watch out for, uh, but in addition to the type A ones. So how does this apply to short segment fusions? I think what I'm thinking about a degenerative one or two level operation, I'm trying to uh, make sure the neural elements are decompressed using the concavity of the fractional curve, but I'm trying to horizontalize things as best I can. Again, we're not turning this into a big surgery, but trying to horizontalize four, five, and five, one. These are all patients some have operated on, some are waiting for surgery and being optimized, but all patients who have some level of biplanar or single plane deformity who had their Start what started out with was a four five or five one fusion that was fused um, in, in a malaligned way, led to bigger problems. 
So this is a quick case, 73-year-old female, left hip pain, L5 radiculopathy. She has 100% leg pain, 0% back pain. And you can see she has a pacemaker, uh, if you see where I'm going. So what do you open this up to the audience. What do you think? When she falls down a little bit to the uh, to the convexity of the curve, so uh, we would be very careful with the fractional curve. We would be very aggressive uh, with the uh, L4 to S1 first, horizontalize mm -hmm. L4, and then uh, go up. Yeah, so I think this lady is 73. She looks about her age. She's We're not thinking about a big surgery. She's got a small scoliosis, but she's got no back pain. I just want to get her out of relieve her radiculopathy. So I just uh, thought about a four to one, but basically went with a five to one, a small fusion, just to get her out of neurologic trouble and just tried to my best to horizontalize five one and not just thinking they're alone. And sometimes I've also put in uh, two banana tea lift cages. That's what we did here, which improves your footprint. Something I learned in fellowship from um, uh, Dr. Ron Lehman. Uh, but you can see, and again, to your point, Alfredo, when she stands up, she's 20 degrees. On the table, she was probably around 15 or so. But I tried to, again, horizontalize things as best I could and do PCO bilaterally to loose, loosen things up and a little bit of compression and distraction just to um, try and make things as even as possible. And it's, again, it's not a deformity operation, but I just keep these principles in line as I try and decompress the fiber. And you buy time for the, for the upper levers too. Exactly. Hopefully she lives to 80 or 90 or, or et cetera, but exactly buying time. So operative techniques to correct chrome malalignment. PCO is sort of the workhorse of most of the deformity operations. Wide T-lifts at the base, symmetric or asymmetric. Uh, and pick your poison, the anterior or lateral inner bodies to accomplish the same thing. Most invasively, you may need an asymmetric three-column osteotomy and a kickstand rod. So another case, a 68-year-old female. Uh, she's got a prior T11 to S1 instrument effusion. She now has PJK, PJF with a little bit of core compression, but her chief complaint coming to the office, even though she's got PJF, is she leans to the right. That's just been getting worse over time. Uh, she's got some leg numbness, but difficulty walking mainly due to pain. So these are x-rays uh, you see here. PI62, pellet till 27. She's got uh, really PJF with screws pulling out or roading into the T10 body and T10, 11 disc space. See, and she's leaning to the right. It's subtle, uh, but she, I mean, 4.7 centimeters, so it's well above threshold. So what would, um, open it up to the audience, what would people do here? Mike, are you there? You know, uh, well, she needs uh, to go up, um, decompress, retreat the PJF. Um, I don't think it, it it's that bad the chrome alignment to do an asymmetrical PSO in the lower spine, uh, but maybe I will try a kickstand rod uh, on the right to put a, to push a little bit to the right to the yep. left. Sorry. Yep. And what about the uh, how would you handle the PJF? I will, I will all, uh, up to the uh, upper thoracic spine. Yeah, any PCOs or any intradiscal yeah. work? Or yeah, I would, I would try to to, to uh, do PS, PCOs at the apex of the uh, thoracic lumbar junction. Uh, I'm trying to use a new uh, rod. I think it's overbent in the in the upper lower spine. Uh, you're doing an inflection point where where she, she don't need that. Yeah, yeah. I mean that's. Uh, Basically, exactly, um, exactly what I did. So in the sagittal plane, she uh, is more. Of a, she's a type three. She's not retroverted. Her PT is less than half of her PI. She's obviously got thoracic hypoglossis. She's got PJF. And I think the issue there was they just maybe met, kept on marching up with the lordosis instead of um, giving a reciprocal hypoglossis there. In the coronal plane, she's got a fixed coronal malalignment. She is fused from T11 down. So we plan for a kickstand rod uh, on the right. So a plan was T11, remove the instrumentation, T11 S1. A T, uh, PCO at T1011 and then one or two levels up and then a T4 to pelvis with a right kickstand rod. And this is the plan for this case, just each step sequentially for myself and the whole room. And just to touch on the technique for a kickstand rod, I think it's useful for fixed coronal malalignments like this one, two C curves, uh, two A curves when the head is towards the convexity because you can throw them off in any case where you notice malalignment intraoperatively. And I think there's not much this is not an overly complex uh, technique, but there's a lot of fiddle factors. So I just wanted to briefly go through kind of the eight steps of how, uh, how I do this. 
So first is place the kickstand screw. This is often dissect anterior the ilium. Um, that's usually around, around the level of the L5 or S1 screw and find some bone there and basically aim this screw. It should be around an A580. Aim it at the tip of your S2AI or your medial iliac screw. So once that's done, intraoperatively place your contralateral main rod or contralateral primary rod and keep this tight. Lock it in. That locks you in the sagittal plane. You don't want to lose your sagittal correction there. So lock the contralateral rod. Then you place your ipsilateral rod. So this is the caudal down here, cranial here. Place your ipsilateral main rod and keep it very long distally because as you correct, you're going to lose that and you don't want to go through the whole kickstand shape and have you lose rod and have to do the whole thing again. So keep this rod long distally. Then place your domino anywhere where you want to hook in in your mid or lower thoracic spine. And put your kickstand rod and then reciprocally leave this a little long. You leave your main or primary rod long distally. You leave your kickstand rod long proximally because you're also going to lose rod here. Then lock. So all these screws above, lock your screws above where you're getting your correction and lock and loosen the screws below. Loosen all your screws below because that's, again, where you're going to lose rod. And then get your rod gripper right here. That's your set screw tightener. And then, I'm sorry, rod gripper right here. You distract in the middle and get ready to distract. And this is just an interoperative video of what, uh, of what it looks like. Get your distractor there, everything set up, loosen, and slowly push the spine back. Again, then I don't think there's a whole lot to this uh, technique. Um, just a lot of little nuances, little steps. And if you loosen everything up, it, it, it is pretty powerful and, uh, and pretty effective. So I got this film interoperatively. I said, crap, what do we do? We, did we push her too far to the left? Uh, and I said, what happened? We only pushed a couple of different rounds, you know, a couple of rounds of distraction. So I also took a look at the acetabular. This is interoperatively what the acetabular is doing. So her left side is down, her right side is up. And I have to go back preoperatively, how is she going to stand? How does she stand normally? Does she have any leg leg discrepancy or anything? So preoperatively, we see that her left acetabular is a little higher than her right. But intraop, it's reversed. So whenever she lands on the table, it's the opposite. Her right side is higher than her left. So I'm thinking, basically, she's going to stand how she stands. Uh, she's going to go back to standing uh, how she did on the pre-op scoli film. So I saw this, and I actually want her leaning a little to the left intraop. If her right hip is higher, if her right acetabulum is higher, that's eventually going to go down. The left side is going to come up, and her head should go back to the right over her pelvis. So comparing... Interop to pre-op is critical in making sure that we get the alignment that we think we're getting in the operating room. And you can get long cassette films or you can use a T-bar if you don't have long cassette films, just making sure you're lining up the acetabular and knowing where they are preoperatively. So post-op, long kickstand rod here, but she luckily she's, she stood how we thought she should stand. And we corrected the PJF, just like you said, Alfredo, three, two or three PCOs. And you have a 6-0 titanium rod, keep it temporary rod, keep it underbended and really can't, strong cantilever force to reduce across the PJF. Let that sit for a while, put my control out all red in, and then go back to that side. Questions, comments? That's beautiful, Scott. I, I got a question. Uh, how much do you distract? Because in, uh, in the operator room, it's pretty difficult to know how much you're correcting the ground. Uh, um, I'm, I'm always struggling with that. Okay, I'm doing too much. Um, uh, there's a tip for planning. Uh, okay, I will just drag it one centimeter or whatever. Yeah, I have not figured that out yet. I wish I could say, okay, she's off three centimeters. I'm going to do four rounds of five clicks of distraction. I haven't done that yet. This is really just you stalled. I think we did three rounds of distraction, which is basically like five or six clicks. And then I said, all right, that's enough. Feel like we moved enough let's get an x-ray and let's, let's assess and we can always change that based on that so to answer your question I, it's really just stopped uh, but i don't have a uh, um a really reproducible way to do that so same boat as you yeah, yeah. maybe using surgery map we can plan the angle uh and translate that to centimeters no uh just just gets it yeah i think if the coronal plane gets a little more attention maybe the um we can start doing that so uh, we got, uh, I see we're almost at time. We have time for one more case or? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, this is, so this is a 49 year old female. Uh, she had one prior, just a one laminectomy. And then after her laminectomy, she saw some, some pain doctor who recommended a pain pump. They went straight to a pain pump and she uh, ended up uh, progressing a severe degenerative scoliosis with a combined coronal sagittal malalignment. So these are x-rays here. You can see a hot middle of the ground, uh, PI 55. 
Uh, she's got a very large thoracolumbar curve, uh, thoracolumbar slash lumbar curve. That's about 50, that's about 64 degrees, I think. Pellet is 27, sacral slope is um, 28. These are her, these are CT scans. So you can see arthritic, stiff fr fractional curve, but doesn't look to autofuse. This is maybe a couple more years, this will go on to autofuse, but it hasn't right now. Uh, so, and she's leaning to the right a little bit, but luckily it's a tube B curve. So if we correct it, she should be in good shape. Uh, she appears cathodic in the sagittal plane. So, uh, Anyone like to take this? Oh, I saw Mike Galgano on the call. I don't know if he's on there, but maybe maybe he's off. Yeah, you gotta you gotta get off. Um, I'll be a bit worried about this case about decompensating with the surgery. So, uh, in my head, this this patient, I try I would try not to overcorrect. Uh, I prefer a worse coronal uh, cuff correction, but a better coronal alignment. Uh, so we're very careful with, uh, with the release in the apex of the upper lower spine. So I, for these cases, I try to put my screws in the pelvis and then, and then construct from the, uh, from the lower up using the, the, the rods as a guide to where the spine had to go. So I try to pull the spine up to the rod and not the rod down to the, to the, to the uh, spine. Um, but th this patient had two problems. The fractional curve is, is to the convex side, um, but have a, a big lumbar curve. So it's difficult to assess uh, in, the, in the bed uh, how much we correct. Uh, I, I'm sure you can correct 100% uh, of the lumbar curve, uh, the cuff, but that may be worse for the patient in the in the long term. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you got to keep her balanced. If you can't correct the fractional curve, you got to undercorrect the thoracolumbar lumbar curve. So, final plan, Alfredo. I would be uh, I would be tend to go to from T three to the to the iliac, uh, multi rod uh, PCOs at L four S one. Just inferior facetectomies uh, in the coronal uh, L1 to L3, and then uh, construct from the lower back uh, to the thoracic spine with uh, multi rods. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, I agree. Upper thoracic is what I ended up doing here, but using, um, trying to implement the principles that we talked about, the loose lead classification. So on the sagittal plane, she's got a high PI. It's right around 50, but we can say she, she belongs in being a type three or four. Sacral slope is 27. So you can think, is that a type one or two? But the PT is close to 50% of the PI. So she's clearly retroverting. So this is basically a false type two. Her sacral slope is falsely elevated because she's retroverting her pelvis. So even though it looks like a type two based on the numbers, it's not meant to be that. Also, I could all, she's got some elements of a retroverted type one. She's got kyphosis over a very short segment at L5. So you could also say this has some elements of retroverted type one as well. In the coronal plane, she's four centimeters to the right. So this would be a type B. And the goal is really to horizontalize the fractional curve. Her acetabuli look even left, maybe a touch higher than the right, but not too much pelvic obliquity. So look, my goal here was to turn this into a balanced type three. T4 to pelvis fusion, T10 to S1 PCOs. I actually planned for an inner body at 5.1, uh, but that, that, that 5.1 was partially fused or very stiff. So we kept didn't have to do decompression, so kept the lamina there and decorticated well from L5. Um, TP, the ALA, hopefully will fuse, uh, fuse there. Again, I use the uh, French company, SMIO, to help plan this. Extremely helpful. This is the plan for the case step-by-step step, and uh, the post-op result here. Uh, trying to restore thoracolumbar neutrality and take out her thoracolumbar kyphosis that she has there. Everything was pretty flexible. Uh, PCO at 5.1 and 4.5 took care of the horizontal, took care of the fractional curve. The major curve with, with reduction screws and dial in slowly uh, came back and uh, long pelvic screws as close to the sciatic notch as possible. So she's about uh, six months out and, and doing well. Comments, critique? Looks beautiful. Looks beautiful. How do you, how do you manage the, uh, the rotation in the adults? I, I don't do the rotation, but uh, uh, do you try to derotate something or just? Uh, yeah, sometimes I've, used, I've done that in a couple of cases at the apex. I will uh, sometimes use a fixed head screw, so not polyaxial, and try and push as much as I can to derotate with the VCM vertebral column manipulators over a couple of screws. But um, haven't had to do it a ton in, in, in adults, but sometimes that's those are the techniques I'll employ to really push down and use a fixed head screw. Okay. Beautiful.
All right. Well, that's uh, that's the most of what I had. Just going to appreciate the time and thanks for letting me talk about some of these topics about the Russell Lee classification, coronal alignment, trying to incorporate this into um, really all spine surgery from single level fusions to, to big deformity operations and showing that alignment is relevant for all uh, all fusion cases. So, of course, I have to show off my uh, beautiful kids uh, to finish up. But thanks. Thanks for your time. Happy to take any questions. Thanks, God. That was a pretty phenomenal lecture. Uh, I really appreciate it. Um, we will have you soon back if you if you're available. Awesome. Appreciate that. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks, man. See you soon.